So welcome to all of you, wherever you are. My name is Gabriel Saez. I'm the executive director of the Robles and Sur Foundation. Thank you for joining us today. As I said, and as an exception in our activities, this meeting will be conducted entirely in English. So if you need the Spanish or Portuguese interpretation, you should move to the proper channel. As we have also requested in Spanish, your microphones have been muted and we ask to turn your cameras off as well to avoid distractions. If you have questions for our distinguished guests today, you should privately direct them to me using the Zoom chat. For technical questions, please contact Pablo Spielman. Técnicos, por favor. Da mesma forma. For exchanging comments, as long as it is done in a respectful way. If someone does not agree with any of these stipulations, he or she is welcome to leave. If someone acts improperly, he will be removed from the meeting. Let me introduce Grupo Roble first. Created in Argentina in January 2015, Grupo Roble is a group of friends and members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints who seek to promote civic engagement among the LDS people. Our initial focus was on supporting those saints involved in the public sphere who, because of their public presence, pay a high and very particular social price, even among their brothers and sisters and family members. Soon, our work evolved to include a sustained effort to provide experiences, training, and when possible, concrete opportunities for the LDS to become active in politics, the civil society, business, and academia. Our main focus now is to develop this, this particular type of willingness, civic commitment, and abilities among the LDS women and youth. Grupo Roble has extended its reach to include the whole of South America now. We have members and activities carried out or in planning in every country of our region. For the purpose of supporting our activities, in 2020, we have established the Roble del Sur Foundation headquartered in the state of Utah in the United States of America. During this process, we have had many opportunities to meet and discuss our purposes and aims with many political, intellectual, and economic leaders. Without exception, we make sure that our, our interlocutors understand that as a group, we do not officially represent the church at any of its levels. If you want, you can watch some of the exchanges with these figures in our YouTube channel, Grupo Roble Sud. Also, because of the different nationalities, backgrounds, ideology, ideologies and party preferences, we do not support nor oppose any political force in any of our countries. Individually, of course, our, all our members maintain their ideas and participate in whatever spaces they choose. Our common features are our values, including integrity and love for one's country, and the desire to cultivate, first in ourselves, the civic virtues our society so desperately needs. This year, we organized a series of conferences under the title of Indispensable Conversations for 2020. In those conversations, we discuss our region's relationship with China, the importance of the family, a common development strategy for South America, the fight against infant malnutrition, and the opportunities and challenges presented by the bioeconomy. Today's meeting is a very telling sample of the goodwill on the political, on the side of the political, academic, and economic figures we have encountered along the way. It's also the last of those conversations for the 2020 year. 
For it, we chose not a national or a regional approach, but a very personal, almost intimate one. And although our guest developed his career in an entire different setting, many of the challenges he faces will also be on our way if we decide to serve our countries and societies as he did. This occasion is the result of a single man's effort. I speak of our brother, friend, and mentor, and the secretary of the Robert Dansur Foundation, Kent Burton. Kent is a recognized policy expert on energy, natural resources, and environmental issues with over 30 years of experience in Washington, DC. He has advised Fortune 500 corporations, trade, national trade associations and political campaigns, and served as assistant secretary of commerce for oceans and atmosphere and the two American presidents. A native of Utah, he has served two full-time missions for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in South America, one in Venezuela as a young man, and recently in Argentina with his wife, Winnie. Kent is a member of the Romney Institute ex Executive Board at the BYU Marriott School of Business and holds a Master of Public Administration from, the, from Harvard University. I will now ask Kent to introduce our distinguished guest. Immediately after, Governor Herbert will present some remarks and then we will have a Q&A session. I have already indicated how to present your questions should you want to do so. Kent? I'm sorry, Kent, you're muted. Can, can you turn your... Yeah, I got it. Is that better? Is that better? It is, yes, thank you. Okay, I apologize. I was very eloquent there for a minute, Gabriel, and you lost it. So, uh, thank you for coming together, Gabriel. Thank you for uh, hosting this particular session. I am delighted at the opportunity. Permitirme ser el anfitrión de esta reunión. Governors of the United States and by m several indicia, uh, the governor of the strongest economy right now in the United States, namely the state of Utah. Uh, before I go further to introduce Governor Herbert, let me also make mention of the fact that one of his senior assistants, Deputy Chief of Staff Paul Edwards, who now is the president of the Wheatley Institute, is also on this call. And we recognize his contributions to Grupo Roble. We recognize his contributions also to the governor and to the state of Utah. Uh, let me just say a few things about Governor Herbert. Uh, he took office in 2009, uh, about 11 years ago, uh, and he is the longest serving governor in the United States. In addition to having been governor all this period of time, he has also served as the chairman of the National Governors Association. Uh, he is right now the president of the Council of State Governments and also the chairman of the National Western Governors Association. Uh, he is very much a Utah, having been raised in Utah County. Uh, he attended the University of Utah he served a mission for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And you can't talk about Governor Herbert without talking about his membership in the church. While his professional life has been characterized by uh, work in real estate and politics, he is first and foremost a husband, a father, and a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints having served a mission in the Eastern States mission in 19, late 1960s. 66 through 68. There you go, 66 through 68. Uh, as a governor, his track record is spotless. 
Uh, as I mentioned a moment ago, uh, the state of Utah has regularly been the, the object of great praise, frankly, consistently being regarded as one of the best economies of any state, the, one of the best incubators for new businesses in all of the United States. And very recently, a publication called American, what was it, Governor? Gordon? American Economic Forum. American Economic Forum went out of its way to sing praises to the strength of the economy in the United States, notwithstanding the fact that we have undergone months of economic incubation, one might say, owing to the coronavirus. In spite of that, the governor has been relentless in urging economic growth and presiding over a thriving economy. And for that, we have a, a population in the state of Utah and, and companies that work in the United, in the state of Utah, but have uh, important populations of, of uh, workers elsewhere. They are grateful for the state and for the governor. Uh, governor, thank you for being with us. Uh, we're going to encourage you to take several minutes, as many as you may want, to uh, make remarks. And then uh, I know there are many questions waiting. Governor Herbert. Well, gracias, Senior Burton. <laughs> I uh, am grateful for that more than generous introduction. I'd say, uh, hola, mi amigos, uh, buenas tardes. I'm honored to be with you today. And um, to talk about, let's just call the topic leadership um, and really share with you some of the lessons that I've learned. I certainly have not got all the answers. I'm not sure I know all of the questions, but we've had a great run in the state of Utah of great success, being identified as the most healthy, diverse economy in all of America. And because of that, we have a lot of people that are coming to Utah wanting to be a part of it. So we're now the fastest growing state in America when it comes to population growth. People like what they find in the state of Utah, wonderful people and great economic opportunity. Um, I'm long on experience, but I'm a little short on time. And Tengo that, mucha experiencia, uh, pero poco tiempo. Soy el, soy el gobernador número 17. Estoy por terminar. Been elected will take over for me, a fellow named Spencer Cox, which you'll hopefully get to know and appreciate. Spencer, he's a fine uh, person, is going to be a, a great governor, built upon the foundation uh, that we've laid for him, which we've built upon the foundation of those who come before us. That's a, a true principle. And uh, so, uh, that being said, let me just mention a couple of things here that might be germane to the subject of leadership. Uh, I have a quote here from a guy named John C. Maxwell, who's an American author and a motivational speech uh, speaker and also a pastor. And he said this, anyone can steer the ship, but it takes a leader to chart the course. Leaders are, who are good at are capable of taking their people just about anywhere they want. Pero lleva más un líder llevar una persona a donde quiere ese, ese lugar. Y la pregunta es cómo ellos te siguen y cómo llamado es un indicativo de buena liderazgo. Leaders become great not because of their power. Sometimes think, people think leadership is having power. I can make people do things. I can control them. But leaders become great not because of their power, but because of their ability to empower others. So that they are energized. They're empowered. They're in fact emboldened to go out there and magnify their responsibilities and improve uh, the conditions they find themselves in. Now, these comments, I think, hold special relevance to Robles del Sur, uh, the foundation, which uses proven leaders to tra train and inspire South American professionals like yourselves to more fully engage in your communities and to become more involved in the public square in business and including politics. It's important that we have government that functions correctly to empower the people. That doesn't happen in every place around the world. One of the secrets of our success in Utah is limited government 
and empower the people to find a better way to build the better mousetrap, to find new ways in a free market system to in fact uh, en enable themselves to find success economically. That's worked wonders for the uh, economy of Utah as we're now the most healthy diverse economy in America. That's because of an empowerment of the private sector, the private people, that's good leadership. Um, let me just mention a couple of things that I think have helped me. And this is certainly not an exhaustive list. We don't have the time to go through all the different factors here, but let me mention two or three if I could. One, everybody should have a good mentor or mentors. It's not just one. All of us have people that we think are good examples and they can teach you. You can learn from them. Uh, I start first with my parents. All of us have opportunities mostly in life to be parents or we're all children of parents. And so really the best mentors you can have is starting with your parents. Uh, the lessons I learned from my mom and dad have treated me very well in my life and have allowed me to become probably better and more capable at my job as governor uh, because of the good leadership that they gave to me, their training and their mentorship was helped me. I was actually a kind of a shy uh, a kid in school, um, a little quiet. Um, that was back in my hometown, which was nothing but orchards, uh, open fields. It was not a metropolitan place. And so, uh, again, my parents worked hard to keep us in food and shelter. Uh, we didn't have much. My mother had a terrific capacity to be able to stretch a dinero, a dollar, to help stretch the money uh, that my father brought home. My dad sometimes worked two or three jobs in order to make ends meet. And my mother was very frugal spending. When I got holes in my jeans, I said, I need new jeans. She'd say, no, what you need is a new patch on the hole. And I patched the knees of my uh, uh, jeans for years. And uh, yeah, we were pretty thrifty. We knew how to stretch a dollar. Uh, my dad started out working as a steel worker. Then he ended up becoming a milkman. Then he eventually got into the construction industry as a home builder. Um, and from my dad, I learned some uh, basic principle. And this is a key ingredient. If you're looking for principles of leadership, uh, there's nothing better than this. He said, you know, you ought to work hard. You ought to have an honest day's work and get an honest day's pay. And his favorite saying he got from his father, he was raised on a farm up in the state of Idaho. It's the Herbert family slogan. And it goes like this. We call it the eight W's. Work will win when wishy-washy wishing won't. Work will win when wishy-washy wishing won't. We all say occasionally, I wish things were better. I wish this, I wish that. Dad would say, don't wish about it. Go out there and roll up your sleeves and go to work and make it be ha happen. Make it become better. Find a way, set a goal. Go and roll up your sleeves, go to work. And because of that, I learned how to work. Uh, I started working out in, in a garden picking raspberries when I was about seven years of age, putting the raspberries in the cases and going around my neighborhood and selling them with my little wagon. Uh, it's 15 cents a cup is what they were. And uh, I learned to actually go out and market. I know how to wash the raspberries, make them look more attractive and more presentable. And I go door to door and I made, I thought a lot of money. I'd make sometimes two or $3 a day selling raspberries. Uh, and so again, I then gravitated, became a newspaper boy. I was making $30 a month uh, doing that, which was good money for me. I collected pop bottles. I mean, I did everything to try to find a way to make some money because I didn't have much money coming from my family. I, I learned that hard work, commitment and showing up just show up. A lot of people won't show up. So uh, again, a, a, a key leadership trait is those who are willing to work hard and show up and engage and say, we can find a way to solve this problem, a, a better way to do this thing. And we can make some money or serve our, our public. It's not all about money. It's about service, most of all. And, and, I, and my dad used to teach me, he said, you know, we live in a wonderful community, Gary, and we ought to give back to our community just to make it better. Uh, he helped neighbors he would take out of his own vegetable garden and deliver around the widows in our neighborhood, driving his little tractor around the town. Uh, he ended up being on the beautification uh, committee for the city of Orem, which is our hometown, trying to make it look better, be better, open up commerce opportunities. He became president of the Chamber of Commerce, promoting entrepreneurship 
in our little town. He wanted to give something back and he didn't get paid for it. He did it because it was a good thing to do to help improve the community. So uh, another of my mentors that I had besides my parents was, and all of us have opportunities to have people that we know that coach us. I had to play baseball, football, and basketball. I had three coaches and they taught me a lot of, in, in the process of sports and competition. Competition is a wonderful thing. It brings out the best in us. And sometimes you lose in competition, but you go back and you maybe train harder and come back sharper and work even harder and, and have some success. And success doesn't always mean you have to come in first place. There's a lot of gradations of success. Just finishing the race sometimes is great success. Uh, I learned how to compete in sports. I played quarterback on the football team and uh, point guard on the basketball team was captain of the baseball team. And I learned in all three of those sports, you can't do it alone. When I was a quarterback, I knew if I didn't have some good receivers that could catch the ball, it didn't make any, uh, it didn't matter how good I could throw the spiral of that football if they couldn't catch it or get open. Uh, if I didn't have a line that blocked and protected me from the defense, if I didn't have running backs I could hand the ball off to, if we didn't have a defense with linebackers and safeties that could do the defense and get the ball back to us on offense. Uh, again, one thing I've learned, uh, success in life, good leadership means bringing together and creating a team effort. And so uh, I'll go from, uh, from uh, the, the coaching mentors. Again, all of us have mentors. When I was in the Army, uh, my platoon sergeant, again, was a good mentor. I learned about discipline in the military and service to my country. Uh, again, I've had uh, uh, teachers, uh, whether it be in church leadership positions of teaching me good principles in, uh, in, ed, in elementary and junior high and high school and college, teaching me uh, information that they helped me develop uh, talent and, and, and characteristics and traits which helped me uh, in leadership roles. I have a great wife who's a big support to me. So mentors, we all have them. If you don't have them, find them and listen to what they've got to say, share with you from their life's experience. And second point is you've got to surround yourself with good people. Uh, as I talked about football, you know, the best team we could have would be the best people we could have around us. Well, team is the same thing in business, the same thing as in government. Uh, we've had great success in the state of Utah because I've assembled probably the best team ever by a governor in the history of the state of Utah. I've got people that are a lot smarter than me, all of us working towards a common goal of making the state of Utah as successful as it can be. The best quality of life, economic opportunity, great a great place to live, a great place to do business, to start a business, uh, a great place to, to live just because of the high quality of life. Uh, Utah leads the nation in volunteerism, it leads the nation in, in charitable giving. That's a characteristic of the people of Utah, which again makes us a wonderful place to live, which all of us can help give back to our communities. My dad said give back to make it as best of a place as you can possibly make by your own contributions. Anyway, my team here at the state of Utah, I have great dedicated staff. I've got leaders in my divisions and my departments, my agencies, all working towards a collective goal. Other elected officials in government, whether it be in the legislature or local government, mayors of cities, councilmen, all again, working towards making their communities. Uh, we have 248 cities. We have 29 counties, all help us become a healthy state. And uh, uh, that team effort is, is significantly important towards success. So, so gather people around you that can share your goals and your vision and, and work together as a team. That's the second point. A uh, third point I'll mention and then kind of shut down after this and see if you've got any questions. You've got to have some principles and you've got to have a, kind of some guide rails that keep you on the straight and narrow path. Uh, uh, integrity is one of um, a significant importance. You've got to be honest. And in politics, sometimes it's a little harder for politicians. They want to say what the crowd they're speaking to at that time wants to hear. That sometimes can put you on the slippery slope of being dishonest, not genuine. And so we've tried to make it a practice in our administration to make sure no matter what the news is, to tell the truth. And uh, those principles help guide us. Henry Ward Beecher, a 19th century former, said this, Expedients are for the hour, but principles are for the ages. Government by whim is not so whimsical. It's a prescription for failure. So if you're just doing, well, whatever feels good today, 
and not for think about tomorrow. You, the principles ought to guide. I'll give you some principles that I've used to guide the state of Utah. This is not any rocket science, by the way. This is basic principles to how you should govern and how you can have an effective government and empower the people. The, prim uh, the principles that have guided me in, in running the state of Utah have been one, we focus laser light, number one on the economy. If you can have a healthy economy, everything else kind of falls into place. So that'll be every elected official's focus. How can you make the economy work for everybody? So that everybody has an opportunity to pay their way, to find ways to, to in fact, receive re remuneration, to put food on the table and a roof over your head and opportunities for yourself and your family. In order to do that, we've set also as a goal, we want to have lower and consistent, predictable taxes. Some states and some parts of the country, they're up and down. And, and that means the private sector has a hard time predicting what's going to happen. What are going to be the rules of the game, you know, in a year from now? We don't do that in Utah. We're very predictable and consistent. We haven't raised taxes in 20 years. We have now the lowest tax obligation under my watch of in, in the last 17 years. So having lower and consistent tax rates, predictability is important. We have fewer regulations. We've tried to have an open marketplace and fewer government uh, impediments, regulations. Not that regulations aren't important, but they only serve two purposes. One is to level the playing field, make sure that everybody can play and compete. And two is to make sure that we have rules in place so that the bad guys, those who break the rules, are in fact punished for, for breaking the rules. That's the only reason to have regulations, those two things. Anything else becomes a drag on society. So we're constantly looking at our regulation and reforming them so that we don't get in the way of the initiative of the private sector. Uh, we live within our means. We don't spend more than we take in, just like you do in your household and your own businesses, as opposed to some of our states and our federal government, which spends beyond what they take in, which is a recipe for failure sometime. It may be in the future, but it's going to come back and hurt us if we don't, in fact, live within our means. We spend more than we take in. Uh, we also want to make sure that when we in the government have uh, received the money, they're sacred trust. And we should make sure that we have maximum return on the investment of the taxpayers' dollars and have efficient government. We, in fact, in Utah, have reduced the labor in government. So we have fewer laborers in government now in state government than we did in 18 years ago. So we're getting more bang for the buck. And we're making sure that, again, we're not overtaxing the people. They can keep their money and spend it the way they think. And we think not just short term, but we think long term. This is not from the next, next election. This is for the next generation. And if you're going to, those principles ought to guide all of us. Not just short term thinking, but long term thinking. And we've applied free market solutions whenever possible. So those are what's guided me. Uh, again, above all, as William Shakespeare said, to thine own self be true. You've got to decide what your principles are, and you should not veer from those. Integrity, honest, hardworking, you know, how you're going to run your business, how you're going to be involved in government, what you're going to say to the people. Uh, strive to be true to who you are. I'm a Ronald Reagan. Some of you may have heard of President Ronald Reagan back in the 80s. Again, one of our great presidents. I'm a Ronald Reagan conservative. Uh, which means I'm, I'm uh, kind of a practical guy. I'm not so idealistic that it's my way or the highway. Ronald Reagan said, if you agree with me 80% of the time, you're my friend. And he talked about, I'd rather get 80% of the job done than fly off the cliff getting nothing done, waving a flag of ideology. So compromise is not a bad thing to do. Um, I'll just give you my philosophy of who I am. I'm conservative in principle. I'm a right of center conservative. I make no bones about that. Uh, I'm moderate in tone and I'm inclusive in process. And that works, I'm honest in what I believe, what I think about politics and government's role in our lives, et cetera, as a conservative. I'm moderate in tone, I don't yell at people. And I'm inclusive, I'll bring anybody around the table and let's work together and see if we can find common ground. And if somebody happens to be a liberal, then they ought to be left to center, but they still can be moderate in tone and inclusive in process. I think that's a recipe for success of bringing people together, finding common ground and getting things done. So real, real leadership really is about, can you get things done? We have people that talk a lot, they're on television a lot, they get nothing done. Uh, it's about getting people together and, and getting things done and getting a positive outcome. You may not get everything you want, uh, but a half a loaf is better than no loaf. 
And I think that's uh, how you get things done, finding common ground and working together, uh, getting a positive outcome, not just scoring political points. And that's what we've done in the state of Utah. I don't know why we've been so very successful. So with that, let me just conclude there and say, again, I, I've had many helpers. It's not something to do alone. I've got many mentors. Uh, leadership is really getting good people around you, as I mentioned before, listening, learning, improving. Uh, and I try to do that. I hope tomorrow I'm better than I am today. I can learn something today. I'm sure that I have learned something today. And, and if I incorporate it into my, uh, what I'm doing and rolling up my sleeves and going to work, work will win when wishy-washy, wishy won't. I will have a better day tomorrow than I had today. Anyway, it's been a great to be with you and hope you've learned something with this. Now I'll certainly take some time for questions. Thank you so much, Governor. It's truly an honor to have you with us. We um, already have several questions, certainly more than we will be able to accommodate, but let me tell the, the participants that if you still wanna ask something, please remember that a good question has two characteristics. It's short and it ends with a question mark. So it doesn't need a preface, a prologue, an explanation and apologies, it's just a direct question. That's particularly important because I would need to translate it into English if you write it in Spanish or Portuguese. But Governor, let me, since you mentioned that your main focus was on the economy, let me abuse my personal position here and connect it with a personal experience. Uh, last uh, January, I was able to attend the Economic Outlook and Public Policy Summit uh, that took place at the Marriott Hotel in downtown Salt Lake City. Yeah. You spoke there and also did a governor, former governor Mike Leavitt. Um, it was on January the 17th, I remember. So there was a panel uh, moderated by Dean Taylor Randall from the Davis Echo School of Business, devoted to economic issues in 2020. So at the end of the panel, Dean Randall asked the four participating economists to describe in one word the state of, and the future of the economy in, in, in Utah. The words they used were, I, I, I wrote those down, strong, promising, healthy, and prosperous. So two, four different economists agree on that positive outlook. But that was January the 17th, as I said. Then the pandemic hit. So my question is, how did you manage to rewire your own mindset and that of your team to quickly change and adapt your agenda and the priorities of your administration? Because it seems like another totally different world and era back in January as it was later. Thank you. Well, thank you, Gabriel. That's a, a very good question. You know, uh, sometimes unforeseen things happen. Uh, we not only have the pandemic, which everybody is familiar with COVID-19, we also had an earthquake, the largest magnitude earthquake since the pioneers came into the Salt Valley back in 1847. We had a category one hurricane windstorm, which means uh, winds over hundred miles an hour along the Wasatch Front. It made the Wasatch Front look like a war zone. Uh, we've had rioting for the first time, uh, social unrest and protests in downtown Salt Lake. First time we've ever had that. Uh, we've had the free fall of the economy. You've kind of mentioned we're also, we had fire, we've had floods and we're in the middle of a drought. Uh, we're kind of playing apocalyptic bingo in Utah. And when the frogs and the locusts show up, I'm going to yell bingo because we all have won. It's been a tough year. But here's the good news for Utah. We prepared for the rainy season. We prepared, we have what's called the rainy day fund. And so we have probably $700 million on our rainy day fund and probably another two or 300 million in different uh, uh, pockets of money that we have, we call working rainy day funds. For example, construction projects, which we can pull off and not do and put the money in another area. They're one-time monies, rainy day funds. And so one, we have a lot of money saved up for uh, whatever the circumstance may find itself to be uh, the surprise. And we also run a very efficient government so we don't bleed a lot of money out of the economy. And although we've had a precipitous fall, 
uh, like every place else in the world, and certainly in, in America, we are now back up. We have more people engaged in the economy in Utah now than we had pre-pandemic. So go back to March. We have more people engaged now the 1st of December. And because people looking for work, finding opportunities out there, jobs that are available, and an unemployment rate, which is now back down to 4.1%. Now, 1st of March, we're at 2.3%, which is the lowest in our state's history. But we're now trending in that same direction. And we've, we're, we get together and we say, okay, we have a problem. It's like we have a hole in the dike. We're flooding somewhere. What can we do to plug the hole? Uh, we found opportunities for us to improve tourism because our wide open public lands are safe places during a COVID, a pandemic to actually people to go. Even though our hospitality industry is down, we've tried to bolster it with other things. We've tried to do more takeout, more curbside delivery to help our restaurants. So there's a solution virtually to every problem, or at least an anecdote, antidote for, for most of the problems, but it takes creativity. And we've said this, when we when it started out, we said, we want you to memorize three words. We want you to adapt, adapt to the new circumstances. You, you have to adapt or die. So adapt, innovate, adapt, innovate, and in fact, then last conquer. So adapt, innovate, and conquer the challenge ahead of us. And all of us need to take that kind of an attitude. And we've done that in government so that when the, when the rainy day season comes and we're in the middle of one now, we can survive and not be buffeted uh, like many that aren't prepared. So uh, again, uh, one of our secrets of our success is we were prepared for the rainy day when it came and we knew how to work our way out of it and we're doing so now. Governor, we are having questions from all over South America. I don't know if you're interested in this, but if you want, I can send you the questions through Ken Burton for you to read afterwards. So at least you know what repercussions your presentation sure. has. I'm uh, happy to do that. Let me, let me uh, choose a few more if you have the time. So one is for, from a business person and social entrepreneur from Buenos Aires and the vice president of our foundation, uh, brother Hugo Ricciuti, and he asked, have you ever experienced tension between your duties as an elected official and your obligations as a member of the church? But let me connect that with another question from Sister uh, Romana Remor from Brazil. You should know, Governor, that Sister Remor is the only LDS woman to have served in the National Congress in Brazil. So the only LDS Congress woman so far in the history of Brazil. And she asks, being a mother and a wife of a bishop, by the way, she asks, how does your family deal with your political participation? Have they ever felt that life would have been sweeter had you not, had you not entered into the political arena? Well, those are good questions. Let me take the second one first. If you enter into the public square and, and, and compete in the arena of politics, uh, it's probably hard to please all the people all the time. You, uh, sometimes you'll please all the people some of the time. And sometimes the people you please one month will be the people that don't like you the next month because of a different issue. So that's just kind of the world of politics. Uh, I think what you try to do is build consensus. Consensus meaning if you get you know, 60% uh, or plus of the people agreeing with you, that's probably a good direction to take, but that takes hard work to bring and build a consensus. I've had a good run as a governor of Utah. My approval ratings have been around 70% consistently for now nearly 12 years. And that's because I've, I've really gone out of my way to build consensus and bring people together so that we don't have a lot of opposition. There's always things, that's the difference between Republicans and Democrats. It's not that we don't have the same kind of goals. We just differ on how we get there. Some want bigger government, to make government to make it to happen as opposed to a uh, more conservative approach to let the private sector. Uh, we've done some studies on the Great Depression when FDR was president back in the 1930s. And we believe that in fact, him trying to have government involved in so much actually prolonged the, the depression for about six or seven more years than necessary. Some would say that President Obama, because he tried to get government involved to solve the problem in the Great Recession, rather than let the private sector, you know, maybe prolonged it. 
So that's a philosophical debate. Some will agree, some will disagree. That's just part of being in politics. My family has had, uh, I think, uh, they, they, they hurt when somebody says nasty things about the governor, but they also just got an opportunity to meet with the vice president and the president here just earlier today, my oldest son, who had never done that before. That was a, a benefit of having his dad be the governor. So there's, there's, there's blessings that come along with it. Oh, doors are open, opportunities. Mi, mi hijo es que puedo conocer al presidente, al vicepresidente, entonces. As the governor of Utah, I'm talking about Utah's history and how the pioneers came there and my ancestors were, were there. Está representando el estado de Utah y falando un poco. Faraway places and came to Utah to, to get away from religious persecution. I understand immigration. I understand uh, uh, migrant workers. I understand some of the refugee problems we see in the world because our people in Utah have lived them. And so it's, it's open doors and opportunities for me to, in fact, talk about the church and my, my belief in the church and, and the history and culture of Utah. So it's been a blessing uh, for most of the time, uh, not in every instance, as it, but, it's, but I can tell you, as my family say, it's been a very positive experience in my 30 plus years as elected official. The first question you ask is there tension? Is there conflict? And I really can't say any time that I've had conflict. The, the, the teachings of the church are one of being honest, serving your fellow man. If you're in the service of your fellow man, you're only in the service of your God. Uh, the Book of Mormon teaches us those kinds of things. Uh, the majority of the people really want the right thing if we let them have a voice. And not in every country is that able to happen being on the, on the philosophy and the, and the, and the uh, government controls that are there. But certainly in America and Utah, we have the right to worship as we please. And, and in Utah, it's been a, never been a problem for me. We have a lot of non-LDS people in Utah. I, I, once a year, I host a gathering of all the non-Mormon clergy, uh, Christian and non-Christian. And I tell them, I want you to know I'm the governor of all the people, not just the members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, but all the people. And uh, we've had a wonderful engagement for the last 12 years. I've gathered these people together once a year and we talk. And here's the interesting thing. We have now these other clergy leaders of other religions say, we are so grateful to be in Utah where we have people who are honest, they care about their children, they care about their neighbors, they volunteer to help. And, and it's a wonderful culture. And so it fits right in with my religious beliefs of what we, we should have. Uh, we read in the Doctrine and Covenants that governments were ordained by God. Government's there to, for a purpose, a good purpose. I'm not anti-government. I just think it ought to be darn efficient and effective and probably a little smaller. Uh, so I've certainly found no conflict. In fact, I think it complements my religion, complements my involvement in government. Um, Governor, um, we are very mindful of your time and grateful for your generosity. But you know, uh, just like in the U.S., our countries here in South America and in other parts of the world, but we are focusing on South America, I are experiencing a wound that is opening all the time, you know, the internal divide. Brazil has its own version of it. Colombia, Peru just changed a president. Colombia had a very difficult situation. Venezuela is a case of its own. Argentina was also divided. Sometimes it seems like Paraguay and Uruguay are the two exceptions. But even Chile, a historically very stable country, has had some serious incidents last year and just a few weeks ago underwent uh, an elect, uh, the public decision to see if they would for the first time change the constitution. So there are a couple of, of brothers from Chile, Oscar Chavez and Sergio Roa Prado, who ask basically the same question. I'm gonna choose uh, Oscar's version, which is what is your opinion about the political divide and how to lead in that type of environment. Well, of course, all... it's one thing for a governor, another thing just for rank and file uh, people, but still. I, I, there are differences in our responsibilities and the roles that we play. If you're an elected official, if you're just a citizen wanting to do good and support an elected official, there's a lot of ways to, to contribute to your community. Uh, one is to run for office, the other is to help somebody else run for office and support them in that endeavor. 
And uh, we don't always win, but we contribute by adding to the discourse. So, uh, uh, you know, getting involved, I think, is a very important aspect of what we need to do. And, and there's certainly going to be division in the ranks. People have different points of view. Here's what I would suggest to all of us. Uh, a famous uh, professor at BYU who wrote a book on the seven habits of highly successful people, Steve Covey, passed away here a few years ago. Good friend of mine. But he had one of his great principles to start with the end in mind. Start with the end in mind. What are we trying to accomplish? If you sit down, Republican and a Democrat, a Libertarian, you know, a Socialist, whatever it may be out there, you say, let's start with the end in mind. What is the end in mind? What is our goal? Uh, we don't really differ in the goal, the end game. We want people to be happy. We want people to be successful. We want opportunities for our children, a, a great quality of life, economic opportunity, jobs to pay our way. No, most people do not want to be kept by government or by their neighbor. They want to be able to pay their own way. They want to have a job. And that's just, I think, natural inside and innate in us that man will work by the sweat of his brow. That was said in the Garden of Eden. And it's from that time forward, we've been working, or we should be. So we, we don't differ on the goals. We sometimes differ on how we get there. What's the pathway to get us to the end result? And uh, I'm more of a small government and let people empower themselves to find opportunity in a free market situation. I believe in the voice of the people, let the people speak and they can choose the way, they can choose the leadership and who they think will take them to the promised land. Uh, others would say government has to redistribute wealth. Uh, people that are wealthy should give some of that money back to the poor. I think that disincentivizes people to actually work extra hard and to become wealthy. And we find mostly wealthy people in America, and we have a lot of them, give away most of their money. They're generous with the money and they find ways in, to give monies to foundations and charitable causes. And certainly in the church, we know about 10% of our money goes to tithing to help with missionary work and helps with uh, the church and the building up of the kingdom. That's part of why we work hard. And that's, that helps benefit the church as we pay a tithing. We donate that money. Well, the same thing works in the private sector too. So again, let's find the common ground. Let's start with the end of mind and then we can debate how's the best way to get there. That's a healthy and an honest debate. Governor, again, uh, we have questions for every single country in South America. But let me ask, let me uh, present you this final one. If you want, if you want to stay with us because you have felt the Latino worm coming from South America, you can, but if you we also are ready to uh, I've you... got another 10 minutes. I got another 10 minutes. So you can fill it up with 10 minutes. Okay. You got, you got well, it, it is oh, mainly up to you. But this is this is a question from Alfredo Salas. You know, Alfredo is the director of communications for the church in the South America South area, including Chile, Paraguay, Uruguay, and Argentina. He's also a former, former mission and state president and area authority. And he asks, considering the whole of your political career, what is your greatest regret? And what is your most important, but generally unacknowledged achievement? I'm, I'm, I'm saying something that is, I mean, the economy and all that is visible and tangible, but what are your little secrets, so to speak? Your regrets and your achievement that is not recognized? Well, if I had any secret regrets, I wish I was a better father and a better husband. Uh, we ought to, ought to make sure that we keep our priorities straight. I have six children. I have 17 grandchildren. Uh, I'm going to be a much better grandfather than I was a father. Uh, so there's some regret there. I, again, we try and we fail and we pick ourselves up and, and try to improve. So if I had anything, I wish I'd been a little bit better in those areas of, of my home. Uh, that being said, in my political career, in my business career, you, you do have the ups and downs. You have the successes and the failures. Uh, I, I wish there's a few bills that I probably should have vetoed in, uh, as, uh, as governor and trying to uh, accommodate and uh, appease may not be the right word, but it's the best one for right now. The legislature, because of other issues we had going on and try to get people to come together. I probably should have drawn a line in the sand a couple of times that I didn't. And so I, I learned from experience. I got a lot tougher 
uh, the long rise governor and, and how to deal with the legislature and the separation of powers we have here in America between the legislative branch and executive branch are real. And uh, sometimes you have to be a little tougher. And I, I got tougher over time. I wish I'd been tougher in the beginning. So that's probably a little bit of a failing I had. Um, probably one of the things that I've done very well that nobody knows about. Uh, and that is I've appointed 105 or 106 judges to the bench. And, it, you know, and again, in America, we have the executive and legislative branch and the judiciary. And the judiciary is extremely important because that's how you interpret the laws that are created by the legislature. The executive branch has to execute under those laws. And uh, what I don't stand for is any kind of activism from the bench. Now, we see some of that on the federal bench, in fact, too much of it. On the federal level, it's been politicized too much. So you actually hear uh, terms like, well, that's a conservative court versus a liberal court. It, shouldn't, it should just be the court. It shouldn't matter whether a person's a Democrat or Republican, conservative, liberal. It's a matter of interpreting the law and applying the facts of the law and getting the decision. If you don't like the decision, then have the legislature or the Congress change the law. So I've been very uh, uh, determined to make sure that when I appointed these people to the bench that they understood that principle. I didn't care about their religion. I didn't care about their politics. I did care about how they made decisions and how they would base that decision. So something nobody ever asked me for, even one time on my campaign trail, I've run three elections as governor. Uh, not one time anybody asked me what I was gonna do to uh, how I would appoint people to the bench. And yet it's one of the more important things that I do that nobody knows about. And I'm very, very grateful and uh, proud of our success on the judiciary. We have a, a, a great court in the state of Utah. Well, um, and it is obvious that it's very important dimension of politics and social life in the whole of the country, you know, that, that's the current debate. Governor, uh, you, should, you choose if you answer the question, but you should know that Catherine Sarmiento from this psychologist from Colombia asked something that is also common and it has its own version, I'm sure in Utah, even in Utah. How did you, what strategies did you use to prevent and fight corruption? When we say corruption here, it's something very crude and overwhelming even, but we don't wanna idealize Utah as a paradise because uh, human beings live there, even if they're Mormons and they are doing their best. But still, corruption is in, inherent to any community, human community. What did you uh, do? Well, again, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. So preventing it from happening in the first place makes it a lot easier to control corruption. Again, we live in a state where the people are in fact, um, very decent souls. They're good people. They care about their neighbors. And that's not just the members of the church. It's all people, all denominations. I mentioned to you, I get together with uh, the, uh, all the, uh, the non-Mormon clergy, Christian and non-Christian alike. I light the menorah during the Hanukkah. Uh, I, I, in fact, have uh, celebrate Diwali for the Hindus. Uh, I, I, we celebrate Christmas for the Christians. Uh, we celebrate things that elevate us as people. Our slogan in Utah is life elevated. We ought to be doing everything we can to improve people's lives, to elevate them. And it's not just their physical side, but their spiritual side. And so we have a culture of that in Utah, which makes it easier for us to prevent corruption. We venerate those who are honest. We reward those who, in fact, obey the rules. And we all believe, again, in the, again, the Steve Covey principle of win-win. I find a way for you to win. I find a way for me to win. We have more success. And the synergy that comes from us working together is palpable. You can actually taste it and feel it. So yes, that's the way you, you, you stop corruption is you prevent it from happening in the first place. The second thing is, in fact, when you find corruption, you punish it. You don't get bought off. We've had people at the highest levels of government that have, in fact, paid fines, have gone to jail, uh, you know, and, and so if we find corruption or people breaking the law, nobody in America, nobody in Utah is above the law. And we have governors that are actually in prison in some of the states because they broke the law. 
And that sends a real strong message to people coming behind. Don't break the law or we're going to lock you up too. I don't care if you are the governor. So uh, again, I would, that's kind of a, uh, changing people from the outside. Government forces people from the outside to do things with the power of, of, of the gun and the enforcement mechanism with the law enforcement, the power of law. A better way for us is to change people from inside. If you can change people inside, their spirit inside, they will do things correctly because they want to do it. They know what's the right way to do it. They know God will bless them, number one. They'll be happier about it. They'll be more probably successful. But even if you're not successful, you'll feel good about yourself. What does it profit a man to lose his own, uh, on the whole world and lose his own soul? Uh, so, again, that's, that's a culture. It, it can't happen overnight. But one by one, if we have people starting to change that culture, no matter where you live, a small town, small state, small country, large country, you can start changing things around one individual at a time. It's a matter of rolling up your sleeves. And what do we say? Work will win when wishy-washy wishing won't. Okay. Let me thank the translators for translating even in this last phrase. Governor, <laughs> thank you so much for this privilege uh, in the... In, representation of all the presents. Uh, let me wish you a smooth transition. Uh, the, the physical and uh, capability to rest after these long uh, years in politics and the vision and inspiration to find your own purpose for the next stage in your life. It's been truly a privilege, unprecedented, and maybe in four or eight years, we will ask your, for your help to have a similar meeting with Governor Cox. <laughs> well, thank you. Now, Spencer uh, was going to do a great job. He's fluent in Spanish, by the way. He served ah. a mission in Mexico. So okay. he, he, he would be just honored to be on and, and talk about his experience. And he's had a length of, of experience. He started as a local government official like I did and worked his way up to the uh, rungs of leadership. And I tabbed him for the, my lieutenant governor. And he's blossomed there. He's going to do a great job. So. Uh, please invite him on sometime. I know uh, Senor Burton can make sure that that happens. Mm -hmm. And uh, all I can tell you is muchas gracias. Uh, uh, I've enjoyed the opportunity. You've been so kind. I wish you the very best. Uh, and I uh, uh, wish you the very best. And adios, amigos. Muchas gracias, gobernador. Gracias a todos. <laughs>